Breitbart News Network, or just simply Breitbart, is a news organization that has existed in something like its current form since 2007. Since mid-2016, it has experienced a vast rise in fame, but now it is perhaps more unprofitable than it ever has been before. Not that that necessarily matters to it. I want to look at Breitbart because a few weeks ago I made a video about BuzzFeed and now I want to examine a news organisation on the other side of the political spectrum. BuzzFeed and Breitbart aren't like-for-like -like organisations, but they do have something in common. They are treated with a great deal of disdain by those who oppose their politics. I've heard the phrases Breitbart readers or BuzzFeed viewers often used as insults. When I examined BuzzFeed, I found that its entertainment section was often racist and often guilty of creating a sense of the other. I've heard people accuse Breitbart of being xenophobic or racist, which leads to the inevitable and important question, yeah, but is it? Breitbart was founded by Andrew Breitbart with Larry Solov as a news aggregate site in 2005 becoming Breitbart as we know it, a news organisation, in 2007. Breitbart himself has an interesting history. Raised Jewish, he found in his early 20s he wasn't sure what he wanted to do with his life, and this was around about the time that his left-leaning politics switched to those of the right. Breitbart was very impressed with the Drudge Report, and aided the construction of its website as Matthew Drudge's first assistant in the early days and he also aided Ariana Huffington in the establishment of her website, The Huffington Post, now HuffPost, apparently sometimes abbreviated to HuffPo. My friend Jumbo is really into betting on horses, so he always reads the Rapo. Information on all the fillies. Breitbart helping with the foundation of The Huffington Post, which I think is one of the most left-leaning, bigger publications, may sound weird, and it is, he was Ariana Huffington's intern when she was a Republican politician. But Breitbart News wasn't necessarily conceived as being a voice on the right, but rather an alternate voice, which is perhaps what Breitbart wanted the Huffington Post to be, a bipartisan platform. When he realised it was going to be distinctly left-leaning, he moved on. Larry Solov wrote on the Breitbart site that Breitbart was conceived as being an answer to what he and Andrew Breitbart saw as an Israeli sceptical, biased mainstream media. What I think Andrew Breitbart wanted when he realised that the HuffPo wasn't going to be by par was to make the websites under the Breitbart banner the Huffington Post of the right. A challenge to both the media and political establishment, overtly on the conservative side of the aisle, but willing to question that side too. He passionately spoke against progressivism, against multiculturalism, against things he thought were weakening America. And this multicultural crap that you instill in our kids the second they get into college and you separate them and pit them against each other so that you can get votes every election cycle, that's ending right now. I think critically in understanding Breitbart, who was often labelled a radical, he thought that the Democratic Party had been overtaken by left-wing radicals. Unfortunately, in the year 2004, the radical left basically did a coup d'etat of the Democratic Party and basically kicked a person that four years before was called the standard bearer of decency in the Democratic Party, and that was Joe Lieberman. Barack Obama is a radical. We should not be afraid to say that. They're a bunch of totalitarian freaks. The way he would speak about the mainstream media, about Media Matters, MSNBC, the patrons of such things or foundations that helped such things exist, people like George Soros, it's clear that he's a reactionary, and he was reacting to what he perceived as an insidious step change in American society brought by an illegitimate elite. Whether he was right or not, of course, comes down to your own point of view. But that's what Breitbart believed, and that, of course, informed Breitbart News. At the start of the episode, I hinted towards Breitbart not being profitable, and to that not mattering. Well, that's because it has, 
since around April 2017, lost around 90% of its advertisers, and its traffic is down around 50%, markedly more than other news websites, which would experience a downward trend after an election, but not to the same extent. At the same time as all of that, computer scientist, hedge fund manager, and billionaire Robert Mercer has supported Breitbart News. In 2011, he gave it $11 million. We jump ahead of ourselves a little bit chronologically. Andrew Breitbart, as much as he may have disliked the mainstream media, he was very good at using it. He was very good at kicking up a storm, and he understood the importance of the internet in the news. In 2011, it was revealed that then US congressman and all-time self-destructive silly sausage, Anthony Weiner, had been communicating in a sexual manner with six women, none of whom were his wife, notable aide to Hillary Clinton, Huma Aberdeen. Breitbart was instrumental in the first downfall of Wiener. I mean, not as much as he was, obviously. In 2009, Andrew Breitbart paid Breitbart contributors Hannah Giles and James O'Keefe to secretly film exchanges between themselves and ACORN, a voter registration and community organiser body. Giles and O'Keefe posed as a prostitute and her boyfriend slash pimp seeking advice from ACORN about how to file taxes for prostitution. But the point is that there's going to be 13 El Salvadorian girls coming into this house. Mm -hmm. we, don't want to, we don't want that to cause any trouble. Well, then you know what? You can always claim them as dependents. But those videos were accused of being heavily edited and adapted to fit a narrative. O'Keefe went on Fox TV dressed as a stereotypical pimp and stated that he was dressed the same during the conversations with ACORN but this was later shown to be false. He was actually dressed as an everyday person, like me. It's important to say that Giles and O'Keefe are political actors. Was Acorn as guilty as the videos made them look? I don't know. But as in the Shirley Sherrod story, I think Breitbart had more at play politically than journalistically. In 2010, Andrew Breitbart posted a column accompanying two video excerpts of Shirley Sherrod, a state director for rural development, giving a speech to the NAACP. The excerpts, which Breitbart had received without the rest of the speech, made Sherrod's remarks sound racist. But the unedited whole version showed her remarks to actually be about overcoming prejudice. Breitbart defended his presentation of the two excerpts and said that his commentary did talk about her overcoming her prejudices and put the videos into context. Miss Sherrod admits that she discriminates against people due to their race. That's a deliberate misrepresentation no. of the truth. I wrote in the piece that eventually her basic humanity informs her to help the white farmer. Andrew, and I'm I kept quoting I, your and, words. Yes, and read the rest of the piece. How can you claim in your book to be so committed to truth-telling? I just told you the How truth. can you do I that just told you the when truth. you publish something? You don't want to hear what I just told I, I, you. you I'm listening to you, sir. I told you, eventually her basic humanity informed her to help the white farmer, and I kept in the part of the ark. The link to that full interview is in the description, and I have to say, I just love interviews where the interviewee is talked over constantly by the interviewer. It makes great viewing. Breitbart's point essentially is, is that she was prejudiced and she overcame that, but that moment she was talking about her prejudice. However, before the whole speech was made public, he seems to use prejudice in the present tense rather than the past. This was not about Shirley Sherrod, this was about the NAACP attacking the Tea Party, and this is showing racism at an NAACP event. I did not ask for Shirley Sherrod to be fired. Without context, the video excerpt does make Sherrod sound racist, and that certainly is how a lot of the mainstream media portrayed her. But, with context, it was revealed that obviously she was talking about overcoming her own prejudices years ago. Breitbart later said that he would have handled the situation a lot differently if he had the opportunity to do so. Breitbart always maintained that this particular story was about showing that the NAACP was wrong in its assertion that the Tea Party was racist. He said that he wanted to show that the NAACP was flawed too. So the story was obviously agenda-driven. That's not a criticism, 
the agenda is overt. Breitbart had a mission, and I don't think he would have ever said that his mission was to be entirely objective. Maybe truthful, but not objective. Now, the biggest change to Breitbart News was the unexpected death of Andrew Breitbart. And whatever you think of his politics or his methods, I don't think you can deny he did achieve a lot by the time he died at only 43. Upon his death, Solov became the CEO, and Steve Bannon became executive chairman. Reportedly, and perhaps as you may expect, the network was in some turmoil after Breitbart's death, but it was Bannon who prevailed as the prime influence. I think that we are in a, a crisis, uh, a, like I said, a crisis of capitalism and really the underpinnings of capitalism. And on top of that, we're now, I believe, at the beginning stages of a, a global war against Islamic fascism. You know, it's part of the reason that we're in this jam is that the establishment has not stood and delivered. He was a founding member of the board of Breitbart News, and according to many commentators, he pushed the organization into a more alt-right direction. I think part of that depends on what you define the alt-right as, but in 2016, Bannon did say that Breitbart was a platform of the alt-right. Bannon, like Andrew Breitbart, is anti-establishment, which is ironic, seeing as he is now a critical part of it. That doesn't mean he's all for it, of course. I guess if you're going to change the establishment, a good place to start is from within. And of course, there is something to be said about the cycle of alternative becoming mainstream and then being challenged by a new alternative. Having been the chief executive of Donald Trump's presidential campaign, Bannon was appointed White House chief strategist and senior counselor to President Trump. In the run-up to the election, Breitbart News was often seen as being friendly to then-candidate Trump, and I think that's hard to deny, and it certainly seems to have remained that way too. Trump's website cited Breitbart more than any other news organisation, but there was an incident where Trump's campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski, was accused of assaulting Breitbart reporter Michelle Fields. A number of journalists and executives resigned because they saw Breitbart News as supporting Trump at the expense of all else, including one of its own number and its own mission. Michelle Fields said they were more interested in protecting Trump and coordinating with him on a message than they were about finding out the truth. It was during the pre-election phase that Breitbart came under attack from various places, such as the Anti-Defamation League, for anti-Semitism and racism. At the same time, it was defended by others who argued that those charges were intended to politically undermine what had become a platform associated with Trump. This article here is cited by the Washington Post as being typical of content that Breitbart used to prominently display before changing its content. It's an example, the Washington Post argues, of content that would appeal to racial prejudice. But here's the thing. The article is about how it's wrong to ignore the significance of race and its relation to crime in the US. It's not anti-black, it's saying that concluding more minorities are in jails because of a racist system is too simplistic. Equally here, the article is talking about the disproportionate amount of crime in the US committed by black men. It's not saying it's because they're black. The point is, is that these articles deal with a subject that many find sensitive and the points in the articles may or may not be pertinent to the wider debate. They may be right or they may be wrong, but they're not racist. Sure, maybe many of Breitbart's articles inform assumptions. Maybe they pander to an audience. Maybe they attract racists, certainly in the comments, but they are not overtly racist. Now, some people associated with Breitbart have, no doubt, expressed prejudicial views. Recently, Katie Hughes was fired for this tweet. Never heard of the IRA? It wasn't that long ago they were blowing up parts of London every week. Breitbart is, without a doubt, politically biased. It frames things with its worldview, it has an agenda, and it makes no bones about it. Its methods certainly can be criticised. There have been stories or aspects of them which have been proven to be inaccurate, and often it feels very tabloidy. In that regard, it is no exception. 
every news organization presents its content through the prism of its worldview. Even if it tries desperately not to be biased, bias exists everywhere. And Breitbart has a big pistachio scoop of that. I think the reason it's often cast as racist or xenophobic is because of its targets and because of its associations. But I think sometimes there is an assumption that Breitbart targeted Shirley Sherrod because she was black. I think sometimes there's an assumption that maybe the acorn sting came from a place of racism. That may be the case, but there's no proof of that. That's an assumption. They were political targets. I'm not celebrating Breitbart, but I think when big news organisations, when the mainstream media accuse it of being racist because it mentions Islamic refugees, or it talks about the Black Lives Matter movement in a negative way, or it talks about black-on-black -black crime, I think that's a gut reaction. Maybe you could accuse Breitbart News of being guilty of dog-whistle politics. But the problem is, dog-whistle politics are very abstract. They're very deliberately open to interpretation. So just because someone or a group of people interpret something that's written as being racist, doesn't mean the writer wrote it to be racist or that other people interpret it to be racist. To give a very simplistic analogy of what I'm trying to get at, if somebody says that they don't want Argentina to beat Germany, that doesn't necessarily mean they're a fan of Germany. It could mean that they're more interested in whoever the winner has to play next. Or they could be an embittered England fan caught between a rock and a hard place. Still, I think the assumptions of Breitbart being racist or xenophobic are the main reason why people dislike it so much. Perhaps much more damning are the inevitable links the organisation now has to the current administration. Business Insider, and other publications citing Business Insider, state that in April of 2017, Jared Kushner, Donald Trump's son-in-law and senior White House advisor, complained to Trump about the negative coverage he was receiving from Breitbart, and that coverage seemingly melted away. Even if Bannon and Breitbart are no longer connected, even if Bannon were suddenly to become no longer a part of American politics, I think people would still continue to perceive Trump and Breitbart as being connected. I think that's a big reason Breitbart will remain in many crosshairs for years to come, and maybe that's the thing. Breitbart started out as an anti-establishment publication, something against a cronyistic, revolving-door system. It is now, on some level, a political entity, and will forever be considered by some, despite its origins in anti-establishment, as a tool of the currently reigning political establishment. I wonder if Breitbart would have maintained higher traffic and experienced a far weaker boycott from advertisers if Clinton had won. Still, there's always another election cycle. Those are my thoughts on Breitbart. Obviously, I haven't covered everything. I didn't talk about Milo Yiannopoulos or the many conspiracies regarding Andrew Breitbart's death, but I've tried to give a balanced overview. I'd love to know what you think of Breitbart and where it fits in with the rest of the media. As ever, thank you very much for joining me. Do me a favour and leave a like, and I'll see you next time where I'll be discussing the phenomena of bureaucracy. Bye.